Uh, guys, turn to Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to get into our, our lesson today. We've got Come on, bro. Come a few on, bro. scriptures to look at today. Let's go, bro. But Hebrews chapter 2, and we're just going to get started in verse 9. On, it's a very powerful passage that we're going to read together now. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. The Bible says, but we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. You know, the scriptures tell us here that when Jesus came to this earth, the Bible says that he came in the image of the invisible God. And it says that he lowered himself in Philippians 2. It says that Jesus lowered himself. And it says that here he even made himself lower than the angels. It says in Philippians 2 that he made himself nothing. That he took on the nature of a servant. And he humbled himself. And became obedient to death on a cross. And it says here in this passage that, that Jesus, because of his suffering, it says he was crowned with glory. And honor because he suffered death. Jesus willingly went to the cross. He, he chose to do it. He didn't back out. He didn't take the easy road, but he, instead he walked that road of sacrifice all the way to the very end until he said his final words on the cross. It is finished. Because he knew if there is no pain, there's no gain. If there are no thorns, there will be no throne. No gall, no glory. And if there was no cross, there would be no crown. And that's the title of the lesson today. No cross, no crown. My first point, no pain, no gain. Now this is a phrase you most definitely have probably heard in your life. No pain, no gain. And it means that with suffering comes growth. You know, interestingly, the phrase no pain, no gain originated in the second century. A rabbi by the name of Ben Hay says, he said this, he said, according to the pain is the gain. And this was always interpreted as a spiritual lesson. Without the pain and doing what God commands, there is never any spiritual gain. And then a 17th century poet by the name of Robert Herrick wrote, No pains, no gains. If there is little labor, little are our gains. Man's fate is according to his pains. You know, this eventually became known as the phrase that we all know so well, no pain, no gain. And we love that saying. Most often it's used in the sporting realm. It's used... In the working out realm, right. let's go, let's go. where people say, you know, in order to uh, make some great gains, to look like Maurice over here, oh, yeah. Yeah. there's got to be some pain. In fact, you know, when I, this gym that my dad took me to as a little kid, that they had this, this poster on the wall that you saw as you bench press. It said, no pain, no gain. And so it pushed you just to do one more rep. And we love that saying, no pain, no gain. But so often, we really hate that saying. <laughs> we hate the application of that saying yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. in our lives outside of the gym. Yeah. We actually hate seeing this phrase, no pain, no gain, play out in our day-to-day -day life. Because we want gains, but no pain. Yeah. Yeah. We want things faster. Yeah. We want things to come easier. Yeah. And we want it cheap. I remember this old Staples commercial I used to watch in the early 2000s, and it was called the Easy Button Commercial. Yeah. Yeah. 
because you have it show all these people in like tough situations, you know, and and then they see the button, the easy button, and they press it, and they're like, that was easy, and it would change everything. That's what we want. We want an easy button for life. Whenever it gets a little bit too hard, too much hardship, a little too much affliction, we want a button that we push, and it changes our circumstances. But in life, there's no easy button. Life is hard. There's going to be hardships. There's going to be affliction. I remember this, this other commercial that I watched, a really funny commercial. And this guy, the opening scene, it has this uh, dude, he looks like a model. And you got this other lady, she's at one end of the pool and he's at the other end of a swimming pool. And she's a model and he's a model and he's standing up there and he's flexing, you know, he's flexing his gains. And he's, he's feeling all fit and happy about himself. And he jumps into the pool and he starts swimming and he swims the, the entire length of the pool. And when he gets to the other end and she's watching him all along, you know, and as he gets to the other side of the pool, he steps up out of the pool, and by the time that he made the swim, now he's an old man. He's bald and fat. And then the life, then the model comes up. Life comes at you fast. <laughs> and that's so true. That's life. Like you're just swimming along, and all of a sudden you're old. <laughs> you got a few more pounds than you used to. You've gone through some stuff, some hardship. Life comes at you fast. And there's pain in life. And as disciples, we've got to learn to approach pain with a different perspective than the world. We've got to see the purpose in pain. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Because if there's no pain, there's no gain. In Philippians chapter 3, we listen to the words of Paul as he writes in verse 7. He says, whatever was to my profit, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may, that I may gain Christ. You now Paul writes here, he says, everything in comparison to being a Christian, that I get to be right with God, yeah. that I get to be in his kingdom, everything's garbage compared to that. Right. Yeah. He says everything's a loss. And, and Paul willingly, he, he gave it all up. He gave up his, his role as a Pharisee, his career as a Pharisee, he gave up his training, he even gave up friends to embrace a life where he would be heavily persecuted. Wow. Where he writes... He would be shipwrecked on more than one occasion, where he would be flogged, where he'd be constantly on the run, where he'd have sleepless nights, and he would constantly be hungry and betrayed by close friends. He gave up that life for a life of pain because he gained Christ. He said, it's worth it. Everything's a loss. Everything's garbage in comparison that I get to be in the kingdom yes. and be with God. His heart was, I, I'm willing to give up anything. I, I'm willing to give up everything that I might gain Christ. Because Paul knew, now a conviction, no pain, no gain. Mm -hmm. And this is the perspective we must all embrace. No matter what you're going through, I guarantee every one of us is going through pain mm -hmm. at some level, some more than others. But we're all going through our own pain, our own hardships. And we must have the perspective of Paul that as we go through this pain, there's, there's purpose in that pain. God is trying to do something. Let's look at the scripture to see what God is trying to do through pain. James chapter 1. Come on, Brad. Let's go, Brad. James chapter 1 and verse 2. A great scripture. I don't always like it, <laughs> but it's a great scripture. Amen. James 1 verse 2. Everybody there? Yeah. Okay. Let's read this together. He says, consider it pure joy. <laughs> pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever everything goes awesome in your life, <laughs> consider it pure joy on payday. <laughs> he says, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials. 
Now those are two things I don't normally associate with each other. <laughs> Trials and joy. Yeah. But God says, I'm going to change your perspective. I'm going to change the lens in which you look at life with. Consider it pure joy. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, so there's not just one kind. He's like, I got many kinds. Many kinds of trials for you to participate in. And he says, here's why, verse 3. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And you got to let perseverance finish its work. So that you'll be mature and complete, not lacking anything. He says, you got to consider pure joy. That's not just normal joy, but the, but the purest form of joy. When you face trials of many kinds. So we got to get fired up for the pain. He says, you'll be fired up. You'll, you'll be full of joy in it. Because you know that it, it produces perseverance. And Romans 5 says that perseverance produces character. And character, in turn, produces hope. God's like, it's going to be tough, but man, you're going you're to persevere, and you're going to get character from it. And if you got character, then there's hope. Yeah. And God's like, man, it, it is tough, but we oh, need God. to go. you got to go through this stuff. Yeah. Because it's, it's, the, it's the character that we need yeah. to endure to the very end. God makes us tough. God understands no pain, no gain. God just makes disciples gritty and tough and strong so that you can go through all of the challenges and any of the challenges that Satan will throw at you. In fact, he, he, he lives inside of us as a disciple through his Holy Spirit, which just gives us that all the power in the world to fight these battles. So we got to learn to see pain through a different lens, and that lens is pain is good. There's a story that I read this week. And there was this doctor that worked in India, and he worked with lepers at a hospital. He ran a clinic. And he worked very closely with lepers, and this was in the 1800s. And he worked with these patients, and he worked with them for many years. And this, this one time, he was taking a long train ride across the, the country. And when he got home from this train ride, he began to notice that he had no feeling in his right heel. And of course, a trademark symptom of leprosy is, is you lose feeling in, in a part of your body, and eventually, you know, you feel no pain at all. And you lose, you will lose that limb, or you know, there's a lot of things associated with leprosy. But he immediately thought, okay, I have leprosy. I've been around it so long. I've been in contact with so many leprous patients that I think maybe I have it. And he began to be worried. You know, we go down the rabbit hole. I'm the Google doctor, you know, I, I'm an expert, right, at Googling my symptoms. And I'm always dying. Oh, oh my gosh, I Google that, you know. I got brain cancer. So, so here we have this guy, and he starts, he starts going down that rabbit hole, and he's like, I have leprosy. And he, he was up worrying, and all night he worried about it. And the next morning he gets up, and his, his foot was still numb. So he takes a pin, and, and he plunges it into his right heel, and he immediately felt pain. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, yes! <laughs> pain was good, yeah. because it meant that he didn't have leprosy. What he'd actually done was, on the long train ride, he had suppressed a nerve. But he didn't have leprosy. His perspective on pain had totally changed. He's like, this is amazing pain. And from then on, Dr. Brand was his name. Whenever he'd cut his finger, whenever he would turn an ankle, and even at one time when he suffered from agonizing nausea as his whole body reacted in violent mushroom poisoning, his response always was with fervent gratitude. Thank God for pain. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> You've got to change your perspective. Like Dr. Brand. Pain is good. If you feel something, you're alive. You're not numbed out. If you feel pain, that means God is not done with you yet. He's still working on you. You're persevering. He's building your character. And you got to tell yourself, pain doesn't hurt that bad. Pain's not that bad. It's, it's, it's mind over matter. 
If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. <laughs> if you don't mind, it don't matter. Let's read verse 12. It says, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. He says, when you persevere, and it's so awesome when you choose to persevere. Because that's really, you have two choices. You can persevere, you can quit. He says, when you persevere through pain, when, when you persevere when you're going through trials, he says you're blessed. And blessed, interestingly, means superlative happiness. Like the ultimate form of happiness, like pure joy. And he says you'll be blessed when you persevere through pain. When you stay faithful and you don't quit, he says you'll be blessed and you will receive your crown. The crown of life. If there's no pain, there's no gain. The second point. No thorn, no throne. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, it said that Jesus is now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. So, literally, Jesus had, as he went to the cross, as he, as he went through his suffering, Jesus had to wear a crown of thorns before he got to wear the crown of glory. Before he got to sit on the throne in heaven, he wore a crown of thorns. What does the crown of thorns represent? Turn to 2 Samuel 23. You know, a great scripture that I read this week. You know, God uses many foreshadowings in the Bible. There's layers. When you read the Bible, there's just layers of deeper meanings. And here he says, he gives us a little insight on thorns. In 2 Samuel 23, verse 6, in the middle of verse 6, it says, But evil men are all to be cast aside like thorns, which are not gathered with the hand. Whoever touches thorns uses a tool of iron or the shaft of a spear, and they are burned up where they lie. You know, a, a thorn in the Bible represents sin or often represents sin. Here it represented wicked men. Paul said, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me humble. In 2 Samuel 23, this thorn represented sinful people. And with thorny people, it says, you got to be careful how you touch them. <laughs> he says, you better use a tool of iron. Or a spear. And you think about Jesus, there was a crown of thorns placed on his head. The Romans would have fashioned the crown of thorns with an iron tool. They wouldn't touch it with their bare hands. In fact, someone told me even in the movie The Passion, when they place it on Jesus' head, they use an iron spear to put it on his head. And what does the thorns represent? It represents you and me. We're sinners. Jesus died for us. And he wore a crown of thorns that, that when he suffered for you and me, he died for us. He was pierced, the Bible says, for you and me. The crown of thorns is us. We are his treasured possession. He died for us, and he wore that crown of thorns, and it says after he suffered then he sat on the throne in heaven. Wow. If there's no thorns, there is no throne. Mm. In John chapter 17, Jesus says, as he prays his last prayer before he goes to the cross, he says, Father, it is time. Glorify me. As he was preparing to go to the cross, his, his crowning moment was the cross. He said, now glorify me. Meaning, let me die for all mankind. This is when he shined the brightest in the resurrection. In Isaiah 53, it says, He was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. 
the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Mm-hmm. You know, the crown of thorns, it literally made Jesus bleed. And we are called to fall in his footsteps. Jesus' very footsteps down the Via Della Rosa as he carried the cross that he was crucified on. In Luke 9, the Bible calls us to carry our own crosses every day. To carry our crosses daily. And you know, Jesus bled for us, and in turn, we will also wear our own crown of thorns. We will also bleed for each other. We bleed for each other. We lay down our lives, the Bible says. True friendship is where we lay down our lives for one another. We're going to bleed to see the world evangelized. Come on, bro. Like, I'm telling you, there has been blood, sweat, and tears. As we all pack up everything to move to a place we've never been before. I think Panyon is the only one. Yeah. yeah. She went to school here in Indianapolis. I've never been to the Midwest. I'm an Oregon boy, like, pretty far away from Indianapolis. But none of us care. We're, we're willing to, to bleed for the cause. We're willing to do whatever it takes for the cause. Because it's worth it. When I look at the faces in the crowd of the people that, that God has brought to us, the people that, whose lives have been forever changed by this mission team, faces like Jada, yeah. faces like Mike, Devonte, yeah. Lennox, Joaquin, yeah. and all the people that he's brought, and all the people that will become disciples through this mission team, the answer, or, uh, uh, the answer to the question, is it worth it, is yes, it's yeah. worth yes. it. Come on, bro. Yes, I, when I look... When I look at this, this room that's almost full of people now, yeah. and I think yeah. back, our first service was just a few of us in a living room yeah. Yeah. at the yeah. brother's house at Dakota Ridge. Yes. <laughs> just a little circle of people. We all, we all, at the end of that service, we took communion together. Yeah. And before each of us took our communion, we said, we are family to the very end. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we shed tears, we cried, because we knew we were here for a reason. We knew we were a family. That's going to do whatever it takes to build a church here. Yeah. A church of disciples. We're willing to bleed for this cause. Mm-hmm. Just like Jesus. Go to Revelation chapter 3. Come on, bro. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. You know, we got to bleed. And, you know, when we bleed, you know, there's persecutions we're going to undergo. There's, there's hardships. Yeah. But we willingly do it. Just like Jesus went to the cross. And the, the, the bleeding doesn't just come from thorny people and persecution. But also comes from us going to battle with ourselves, the thorns in our flesh. Like you go to battle daily. Like maybe you get persecuted every once in a while, but man, you go to battle with yourself. You persecute yourself like daily. The thorns in the flesh will make you bleed. And you got to fight your sinful nature every day. Those are hard. That's painful. But like Jesus, we willingly take on this crown of thorns. We willing. We're like, here am I. Send me. Yeah. Sign me up. Pure joy. Come on, bro. That's the heart of a disciple. But we will be victorious. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, the Bible says, To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. This is an awesome passage. Jesus says, Just as I was victorious, just as I took on the crown of thorns and I suffered to the point of death on that cross. And I was victorious and I I got to go to heaven and sit down next to God. He says to you, to to those that are victorious, you get to sit next to me on my throne in heaven. Let's go. No thorns. No throne. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.12, if we endure with him, then we will reign with him. And that's what disciples do. We endure through pain. We endure through hardship. We willingly put on a crown of thorns because we know if there's no thorns, there's no throne. My last point. Come on, bro. No gall, no glory. Turn to Matthew 27. Let's go. You guys with me? Yeah. No gall, no glory. Come on. Matthew 27, verse 27. Is everybody there? I'll give you a second. Amen. 
Verse 27. The Bible says, Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium, and they gathered the whole company of soldiers around him, and they stripped him, and they put a scarlet robe on him, and then they twisted together a crown of thorns, and they set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hell, king of the Jews, they said, as they spit on him. And they took his staff, or the staff, and they struck him on the head again and again. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe and they put it, they took off the robe and they put his own clothes on him. And then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. And then they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the school. And there they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused. He refused to drink it. You know, here we find Jesus before he's crucified. And I don't know if you know how much pain he went through before the crucifixion. He was beaten, he was beaten up. He had been up all night. He had been flogged. He had been mocked. He had been spit on. All of this before he was crucified on the cross. And in the midst of all of this pain, as he goes to the cross, it says that he was offered wine mixed with gall. And I had to look up, okay, what exactly is gall? And gall was... an. uh, 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 an analgesic, I guess is how you say it. Is that, is that the pro- my medical folks in here? Yeah, yeah. An- analgesic? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. What it was, was a, was a, uh, a pain reliever of sorts. He was offered wine mixed with a pain reliever. It was a mixture of wine and gall, and it was commonly given to criminals before their execution in order to ease some of the suffering. And it says... That Jesus wouldn't even drink it. The gall was what Jesus was offered to numb out if he wanted to. And he refused to take it. He refused to let his crowning moment, his glory, the cross, to be tainted by choosing to numb out in his final hours. I think the correct wording of this point should be say no to God yeah. wow. or there is no glory. Wow. 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 Yep. Because the fact is is that in our world today, so many people, and, and I've been that, this person I'm going to talk about right now, so many choose to numb out rather than feel the pain. In America, we spend $100 billion a year on alcohol. There is $10 billion spent every year on pornography. Every second, just wrap your head around this. Every second, 30,000 people view pornography in America. In, that's just America. And, and why, and I could just go on with the statistics. Most people, here's the answer. Most people would rather check out, numb out, than go through pain. As they go through pain, there's no purpose in the pain. They don't don't have hope through the pain. Mm -hmm. So they'd rather numb out because they don't know God. With God is where you find peace. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, and peace. But see, the world does not have God. And so it has to turn to something. It has to turn to its gall to ease the suffering. But it's a lie from Satan because it really doesn't do that. It it actually, in turn, makes you more sad. It makes you more hopeless. You turn to these these idols, these things that that promise love, joy, and peace. But it, it actually just makes you more and more and more depressed. You see, as disciples, though we live in the world, we are not of the world. Yep. Mm-hmm. And as disciples, we, like Jesus, refuse. Mm. The, 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 the cup of gall is before us, but we refuse to drink it to ease the pain. Yep. 
It's interesting. The Greek word for gall is kole, which literally means poison. <laughs> gall in the Greek means poison. Gall is poison. See, whatever Satan offers you, whatever gall he presents to you to ease the pain, to numb out, whatever gall that he's prepared for you and offered you, no matter how it looks or how sweet it smells, it's poison. It's poison. It will kill you in the end. It may feel good in the moment, but it's poison that will take your very life. And so like Jesus, as we take up our crosses daily, let us refuse to numb out. Yeah, come, on, bro. come on, bro. Let us refuse to turn to the gall to ease the suffering. Yeah. Let us approach pain with a different perspective. Yes, let's go. And to see purpose in the pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To think about the pain we go through and, 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 and to see it as God is molding our characters and through that pain is giving us great hope. Mm-hmm. Now, when you think about pain, so often we think about the pain as in the form of persecution or some outside force or something Satan has done towards us. Mm-hmm. But what about the pain of being pure? Mm-hmm. Yeah. When we as disciples say, you know what, I'm not going to drink the gall of impurity, but I'm going to be I'm going to be a pure man or a pure woman. That is painful. (laughs) Because it takes daily denial of self. We live in a world full of impurity. It's coming at you 100 miles a minute. All the time. Every billboard. Every pop-up. And so when you say, no, that's not going to be me. I am not going to drink that gall. That takes a daily battle and daily struggle. What about the pain of forgiveness? When someone hurts you, when, when, when someone has, when you have been legitimately wronged, the pain of forgiveness. The, I, I remember, <clears throat> every, I'm, this is going to date me. There's some people in the room that have seen this, but happy days. Raise your hand if you even know what happy days is. Does anybody remember the Fonz? Fonzie? Okay. The Fonz was this character. He was the cool character. Everyone, everybody wanted to be Fonzie. And he'd come in, you know, all cool with the leather jacket, and all the girls would like swarm to him. But whenever Fonzie did something wrong and people would point it out, he could never say, I'm sorry. He'd always try, but his pride wouldn't let him. He's like, I am. And he just could never do it. It was too painful for him to say he was sorry or admit wrong. Some of us are like the Fonz. We've been hurt. We're like, we're unyielding. I'm not forgiven. I'm going to hold on to that bitterness. And bitterness is like a poison. You, yeah. you drink that cup of bitterness. And, and the thing is, it kills you, but you want someone else to die. Yeah. They're going along with life. They don't even know you're bitter at them. They're happy, pure joy. And you're dying on the inside. It's because you're drinking poison and expecting somebody else to die. How about the pain of waiting? Delayed gratification versus instant gratification. We live in a world that just wants it now. I want my husband now. I want my wife now. I want a girlfriend right now. I want a boyfriend right now. <laughs> but see, and we don't want to endure the pain of being single. And so we compromise. Yeah, come on. <laughs> but the Bible doesn't say this, but I definitely believe God believes us. Good things come to those who wait. Yeah, come on. <laughs> because patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we sit around so often just dreaming about and wanting the right man or the right woman. And we want it now. Versus change your perspective and focus on becoming the right man 
or a right woman. And when you become the right man or right woman that will lead that person to heaven, then God just maybe will give you the right man or right woman. Right now, God is refining all of us through pain and affliction. Don't numb out. Say no to gall so that you can see the glory. In Philippians 2, go to 1 Corinthians 9. Come on, bro. But in Philippians 2, Jesus says that he made himself a servant for us. And I want to finish here with 1 Corinthians 9. And talk about becoming a servant to all as we close. 1 Corinthians 9. Paul writes, Though I am free and I belong to nobody, I've made myself a slave to win everyone. Or to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I've become all things. To all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I might share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one will get the prize? So run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it. To get a crown that will last forever. Yep. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul says, I make myself a slave, a servant to all. To the weak, I become weak. He says, I, I do this so that I can win some. And this is the truth, man. We, we get up every day, and we persevere, and we push through, and we bleed, and we go through the pain to win some. You know how many people walk away from the truth? There's more people that walk away from the truth than accept the message. We do all of this to save some. You know, I studied the Bible yesterday in Starbucks with this guy named Jacob. And we did the kingdom study. It was so awesome because at the end of this Bible study, he saw in, in one hour's time, God's plan for his life come before him. Amen. He saw the scriptures. It all made sense. It, it was a beautiful thing to see him understand God's plan, God's purpose, everything in one Bible study in one hour. Wow. And he yeah. started to tear up. And I started to tear up. And the other people started to tear up. And I looked at him and said, you know what? In 22 years, I've been doing this for 22 years. I've studied the Bible with hundreds, maybe thousands of people. This moment never gets old. Yeah. It never gets old. It never will. Seeing the light come on in someone's heart. Seeing somebody understand their purpose for the very first time. To see, to see people understand the pain of what they're going through and purpose in it. To see the light go off that, that they can find peace. Amen. And that their life can be different. It is worth it. It is so worth it. And he says here, he says, you're in a race. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. But it's a marathon that you don't stroll. You like start out full speed and you keep that speed going. <laughs> yeah. And he says, he says, in this marathon, you're going to go through some strict training. And he says, you got to beat your body, make it your slave. Refuse the gall, because there's a crown waiting for you. And it's a crown, he says, that will last forever. Not a temporary one, mm -hmm. but one that will last forever. In 2 Timothy 4, as Paul writes to Timothy, this is, what we're going to read now is Paul's very last words in 2 Timothy. It's the last letter that Paul ever would write before he died. And he died faithfully, as he writes in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have fought the good fight. That's what I want to be able to say. Yeah. When, 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 when I approach God, he's like, 
How'd you do? I just want to say those words. I fought a good fight. Yeah, He's like, I, I know you did. I just wanted to ask you anyway. Come on in. <laughs> I have fought the good fight. I have finished my race. On, bro. I have kept my faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, yeah. which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Can you imagine the moment that God places that crown on your head? I have finished the fight. I have, I have finished my race. I have fought the good fight. And he says, I know you have. And here's your crown. He says, come sit with me on my throne. He says, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Paul, just like Jesus said in his final moments, said, it is finished. I have fought the good right, I fight. I have finished my race. And our hearts must be like Paul's and like Jesus's, that we will do whatever it takes to finish our race. When it gets tough, we push through. Because we know where there's no pain, there's no gain. No thorns, no throne. And if we don't say no to God, then there will be no glory. And if there is no cross, there is no crown. And to God be the glory. Woo!